going to have uh, the Lord's Supper here in a little bit, really in just a few minutes. And I, I'm not going to take much of your time. I just want to share with you a few things that, that might help you prepare your heart for our time of breaking bread and partaking of the cup. I am mindful that sometimes we take for granted that everybody knows what communion is. Sometimes if you grow up in church, you start to take things for granted. If people come in, you think, well, they know what I know. Truth be known, that sometimes they don't. Sometimes they know more than you know. But sometimes they don't. And so I want to take a few minutes and, and just go through a few scriptures as to, to why we take communion. Why we break that bread up into little pieces. And why we, we take that cup full of juice. What, what does it mean? Why do we do it? What are we saying when we do it? Make sure he finds where he's supposed to be. Well, he's not one of mine. <laughs> oh, here's Mama. There you go. Come over here, buddy. It's okay. Jessica, what's his name? Tristan, we're proud of you, buddy. Glad you're here. You'll get, you're almost there. Warmer, warmer. That's what we should have done. We should have played hot and cold with it when it came in. <clears throat> there it goes. Warmer, warmer. So we, we need to be reminded, even those of you that are already familiar with, with this, you need to be reminded. What, what's this for? Why am I doing this? And rather than take you into the upper room, which is where the first Lord's Supper occurred, I just want to take you and... and get a glimpse of the ministry of Jesus when he spoke about himself in such a way that it only makes sense that we would commemorate and honor him in this way now because of what he said and did then. That's why we say and do this now. And I was thinking about the words of Christ and the things that he said. And if you've not read through the Gospels and if you're not familiar with, with all the things that Jesus said and preached during his earthly ministry, then some of the things that I'm going to say here this morning might surprise you because no one else has ever walked planet Earth and said what Jesus said about themselves. No one has even dared to say of themselves what Jesus spoke on multiple occasions about Himself. And I want to pose it to you this way this morning. Either Jesus is telling the truth. Either He is truthful in His statements about Himself or He's a liar. He's either speaking the truth or He's spreading a lie. But it can't be both. You can't call someone a good man, an honorable example, someone that we should aspire to be like, knowing that they've said this about themselves. You can't be a liar and a good man. You can't be a fraud and an honorable example at the same time. So either he is speaking the truth and therefore is much more than a moral teaching, much more than an example to follow, or he's a liar, and we've got no business being here. It's one or the other. If you and I believe what he said, we accept it as truth. But if someone denies what Christ has spoken, then he's taking a great there on eternity. He's saying that eternity will work out a different way than what Christ has spoken. By making that choice, he's calling Christ a liar. So either it's the truth or you and I are taking a very dangerous dare. Can't be both. Through his own words, he has excluded the option of having it both ways. 
you either place your faith in Christ or you place your faith in you or someone else. But there's no room for you to give him a little bit and spread the rest out elsewhere. The Bible, his own statements, don't give you that option. So we'll start. John 6, 35. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus replied, and I'd love you to read the quoted words with me. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Do you see what Christ says of himself? He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me won't be hungry for what others have to offer. Whoever comes to me won't be thirsty for what others have to give. I will satisfy those who come to me in faith. He's the nourishment that our souls so desperately need. He's the supply to the gaping hole that we have in our hearts. People try to fill that hole with other things, none of which will work. There's only one satisfying person for us and it's Jesus now in John chapter 8 verse 12 Jesus says this Jesus spoke to the people once more and said read this with me I am the light of the world if you follow me you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life In this verse, he either speaks the truth, he either is the light, or he's a liar. Either he's the light of the world, or he's not. You get to decide. But he says who he is. You either believe him or you don't. But just know that when you disbelieve him, You must, therefore, put your belief in something else. You you must plant your roots in another foundation because you are pulling away from Him. He says, if you follow me, and on multiple occasions throughout Scripture, He said, follow me, follow me. He says, if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness. So, based on that statement, Christ is declaring that walking with anyone anywhere else is darkness compared to walking with Him. All other religions, all other faiths, all other motives, all other efforts are in vain. He says those are paths of darkness. Well, I don't know if you've ever tried to get around much at night in the dark but it's good to have a light, isn't it? Good to have a light. What does that light do? shows you the way. Gets you where you're supposed to be. Jesus is the light. He is the way. He'll get you where you need to be. He said you will have the light that leads to life. The destination of every belief is eternal life. You and I have eternal life. The Bible says in John chapter 10 verse 9 Jesus is speaking here so read this with me Yes, I am the gate Those who come in through me will be saved They will come and go freely and will find good pastures Now you may have noticed by this point that Jesus says the same two words at the beginning of every verse that we've read thus far. He says the word I am. 
He's not saying some think me to be. He's not saying 2,000 and some odd years from now, the people at Fair Plains Church are going to hope this is true. He says right there on the spot about himself, I am. You can't misquote him when he says so clearly, this is who I say I am. You may say he's someone else, but he says he is this. Either you are right or he is right. But not both of you. He's either telling the truth or you are taking a very dangerous dare on eternity. In this passage, he declares himself to be the gate. Some of you might have had a neighbor down the street when you were growing up that had a pretty little white picket fence around that yard. Maybe it was your house that had the, the fence around it. But somewhere along that fence there was something intentionally placed there to allow others to come in. The little swinging gate. Right? Jesus says, the Father has established the boundaries of heaven. There's a high wall and there's only one gate that will open to allow you to come in. That gate is not you. That gate is not Muhammad. That gate is not Confucius. That gate is not Buddha. That gate is not a moral code. That gate is not a certain standard. That gate is not your best efforts. That gate is not your positive thinking. That gate is not what you can do. The gate, Jesus says, is himself. Now, here's the thing. I'm not saying he's the gate. He says he's the gate. I'm just agreeing with him. I believe that Jesus is the only opening to the heart of God. The only way. That's it. Jesus said it of himself. Either he's telling the truth or he's a liar. In John 10, verse 11, just two verses later, he says this of himself. I am. There are those two words again. Now those are very historical. I don't have time to preach into that, but that goes way back into the Old Testament where God said, I am. Now Jesus is quoting the Father. Why? Because he said, I and the Father are one. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Je Jesus is very clear about who he is. He understands his position in the Trinity. That of being equal with the Father and equal with the Spirit. He says, I am the good shepherd. Read it with me. Let's do it again. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. Now this is important. Jesus now says of himself, I am the one who takes care of the sheep. I am the one who watches out for the sheep. You and I, here in this reference, are considered the sheep. We're the followers. Sheep don't lead sheep. I don't know if you didn't know that or not. But sheep don't lead sheep. They're too dumb. It's just true. It's just true. Sheep don't lead one another. They have to have a shepherd. If they don't, you know what happens? Do you know what happens without a shepherd? The flock scatters. The shepherd is the central figure that keeps the flock together. And he says, not only am I the one taking care of them, but I am even giving my life for them. You see, this Jesus that we make so much of is not just a towering figure in heaven who sits at the right hand of the Father. And, and does this and this and this. He is the one who became flesh and dwelt among us, who was silent as a lamb before those who would slaughter it, and he died so that you and I could have life. That is the true good shepherd. He 
doesn't just lead the flock. He doesn't just love the flock. He died for the flock. And praise God, He rose again for the flock as well. Who is the central figure in your life? If it's Jesus, then you have some things. You have consistency. If it's Jesus, if He is your shepherd, then you have stability. If it's Jesus, then you can have peace. It won't, it won't just happen. You have to walk and trust Him, but peace is available. If it's Jesus, you have hope. If it's Jesus, you have a future. But if your central figure is you, you're in trouble. If the central figure of your life is you, then you are on a dangerous path. Jesus presents himself as the good shepherd and allows anyone who would follow him to become a part of the flock. But that's a decision that you have to make. He says in John eleven twenty five 25, these words, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Jesus isn't just the nourishment you need now. He's not just the shepherd that you need while you walk this road. He is the one who is able to transfer you from this life into the next. Jesus is the only one capable of giving you life after death. You know anybody else that came back from dying three days later? Anybody? Anybody? No? Didn't think so. You know why? Because that's Jesus. That's Jesus. Jesus is the resurrection. And the life. And the reason why he puts it that way is because the resurrection occurs first and then you have life thereafter. Your physical body will fail and die. The body that you now walk around in, your earth suit, is going to wear out one day. You will die. Jesus says, even after physical death, I will give you eternal life. You won't find that anywhere else. By the way, did Muhammad raise again three days later? Somebody help me out. I don't think so. I, as a matter of fact, I, I am positive that no other formative religious leader is followed because they were resurrected. They're followed for a lot of different reasons, but not because they're the resurrection and the life. That's just Jesus. Lastly, we'll look at John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Listen, folks, it gets really this simple. He's either telling the truth or you and I are living a lie. Jesus is either the way and the truth and the life. He's either the only way for me to get through the Father. Or he's not. And if he's not, he's a liar and I'm not following him. But with all my heart, I believe he is exactly who he proclaimed to be. I'd stake my life on it. As a matter of fact, I'll stake my eternity on it. What about you? Are you so sure of your eternity that you'd stake your life it's Jesus then according to the word of God you're headed in the right direction but if you are staking your eternity elsewhere you're taking a dangerous dare on your future look at what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 10 32 and 33 this is Jesus speaking concerning the cost of denying him this is the cost of denying Jesus Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But 
Everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. He presents himself to you for you to accept. You can acknowledge him here on earth. And he says, because of the choice you've made, the faith decision that you've made to trust me, I will stand before the Father and acknowledge you. But if you deny me on the day of judgment, you will stand alone. I will not acknowledge those who have denied me. That's the cost of denying him. That's the cost of rejecting his words about himself. There's no middle ground. It's either Jesus or someone else. You cannot have it both ways. You and I in just a moment are going to take the bread. Jesus said that the bread represents His body which is broken for us. It was broken on the cross. Why? Because there's a penalty for sin. And Jesus paid it all. When we partake of this bread, we are saying that our faith is in Christ alone. If your faith is not in Christ alone, then you've no business taking of the body of Christ. It's all or none. We'll then take the cup. The Bible says that Jesus took the cup and he passed it to his disciples and he said, this is the blood of a new covenant between God and man. What was he saying there? That while on the cross, not only would his body be sacrificed for our sins, but that the blood shed would be the payment for our sins. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Jesus said, I have come to die so that you may live. When you take the cup, you are recognizing that your faith is in Christ alone. In what he accomplished to completion on the cross. If you don't believe what Jesus said about himself, then you've no business partaking of the cup. Now, preacher, why are you warning us like that? Because the Bible commands me to warn you like that. Because God takes the death of His Son quite seriously, and He doesn't care much for people who treat it flippantly. Take Him, all of Him, or have none of Him at all. One or the other. By God's grace, you get to choose. You get to decide. Jesus or me. My way or He is the way.